And it's beautiful to have people in here. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 103 with me this morning, please. Psalm 103 and verse number 1. Psalm 103 and verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is moved from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are but dust. Father, bless your holy word. I pray that you bless it, anoint it, Lord. And I pray you'd open our hearts today to receive the truth and the spiritual truth that we need from God's Word. Help us to have a time of fellowship together now, Lord, around the Scripture. And Father, I know that all the demons of hell, I know Satan, I know every wicked thing does not want the Word of God preached. I know that. But Father, you are greater than what's the Satan. You're greater than any spiritual power that would try to hinder your Word from going forth. And so now in Jesus' name we stand and we proclaim it as it is the word of truth, as it is to men. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There's one thing about the 103rd Psalm, and that is that it is the psalm of a liberated soul. There's no question whatsoever. And we know that it is a psalm of David. We understand that. And we wonder if David wrote this psalm after that he'd gotten right with God. The 51st Psalm, if you've ever read that one, you'll see where David cried out to the Lord and said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And David cried out to God. And do you know what? God has his way of forgiving us of our sins. He did that because the Lord Jesus went to the cross at Calvary and died so that we could be forgiven. So David cries out here in Psalm 103 as a liberated soul. So how do you know he's liberated, preacher? Because he blesses God. Look at verse number 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is one of those psalms that starts and ends with the same word. Note carefully, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Verse, 20, verse 22. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So encapsulated between those two statements are all the blessings of God that the that David applies to him. Notice too also you have 22 verses in the 103rd Psalm. 22 of them. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So therefore we have a verse for every letter of the Word of God. The 103rd Psalm is an important psalm because it is David crying out to God having been forgiven of his sins. Do you know what it's like to be forgiven? Do you understand what it is to have your sins washed away in the blood of Christ? Do you know what it means to have not long, no longer be what you used to be, but God's made you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Amen. You knew, if you don't know that from the heart, then my dear friend, you don't know it at all. Because it's not a matter of convincing yourself in your head that you're right with God. From the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you look at the 51st Psalm, you'll see that David repented. Chapter 51, verse 1. 
one. Have mercy upon me, O God. He's crying out to the Lord. And David confessed, look at verse number 4 of Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil. His heart is pouring itself out to God. And when the heart pours itself out to God as the sinner, then my dear friend, there's going to be some confession. The Lord Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You say, you mean the Lord said there are righteous people? No, no. The Bible said in the book of Romans, there is none righteous. No, not one. So what did he mean, preacher? He meant simply this. When that Pharisee walked in and he looked before God and he said, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not as other men. You know, I do this, I do that, I do this. He was righteous in his own eyes. But when that sinner walked in there and he pounded his chest, said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus said he went down to his house justified. Christ is the answer for every sinner that's ever walked the face of this earth. Amen. Not religion, not the church, not not to turning over a new leaf, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So we read over here in Psalm 51 and verse number 1. Notice what he says. He says, I have, please have mercy upon me, O God. He's pleading for God's mercy. He didn't say, God, be just with me. He, he didn't say, God, I want justice from you. He said, Lord, I want mercy. And when you cry out to God for mercy, you'll get mercy. Psalm, uh, Job chapter number 42 and verse number 6, Job cried, Wherefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. Any man that's ever come face to face with God, that you've come before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the true and living God, the only God there is. All the rest of the gods are created things by the hands of men or demons. The one true and living God, when Job came before him, he said, I abhor myself. He didn't say, I love myself. He said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repentance, therefore, is a gift from God. The Bible said in the book of Acts chapter 11, verse 18, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It comes from God. You say, preacher, you mean I can't just decide to repent? No, you can't. Because that's like a New Year's resolution. You decide you're going to change your life. You're going to do better. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. But it's not long before you're right back to the same pit you started from. The Bible said in the book of Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 31. For to give repentance to Israel. Then in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse number 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. In other words, you agree with God. When you really begin to agree with God about who you are and what you're made of and what goes on inside your soul and you allow God to begin to talk to your heart not your mind when you allow God to speak to the depths of your soul then you're a candidate for repentance when you stop resisting the Holy Spirit when you stop grieving the spirit of the living God then you're a candidate for repentance the Bible said in Luke chapter 13 verse 3 I tell you nay but except you repent you shall all likewise perish then in Luke chapter Chapter 16, verse 30, he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one go unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is a spiritual book. The words are spirit and the words are life. The word of God was quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. God had him eat the word and when he ate it, it tasted like honey. But once it was in the stomach, it made his belly sore. There's something about the word of God that speaks to us like nothing else does. And here's why. The Bible is alive. This book is alive. Therefore, for if you'll believe what God says in his word you can be a candidate for repentance. We've got a generation today that preaching that repentance is not necessary. They're telling people that repentance is works. John chapter number 16 verse 7 says this, nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Yet if I go not away the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart I will send him unto you. And when he has come he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Repentance therefore is a work 
of the Holy Spirit of God. This is why people that repent, they repent out here in the world of God, of, of, of worldly sorrow. They get tired of being hungry. They get tired of not being able to pay their bills. They get tired of their problems. And so they turn over a new leaf. They try something different. It may work and it may not work. But in any sense of the word, in no way does it draw them closer to God. Only God can draw you closer to God. And the Holy Ghost, when He comes, He will come and He will convince the world of sin because they believe not on Christ. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. One thing he said, all this clearing of yourselves. That word clearing comes from the Greek word apologia. You ought to know that in English, apology. But in Greek it means something different than it does in English. In Greek it means that I expose myself. I am what I am and I don't like what I am. And I want God to do something to help me. That's what I want. Don't you want that? I, I want God. God's got to do something for me. I've got to have something spiritual or I'll drop them down the bone. Out here in this world all you get is a bunch of flim flam materialistic nothing for nothing for nothing and they don't know what they're talking about and they don't know where they're going because they have no light and they have no sense of God in their soul vast number of our churches today are preaching a feel-good message as a result people feel entitled self-absorbed God becomes their personal genie in other words, just rub him the right way and God will pop up and give you everything you want. God becomes your servant. This is the kind of stuff that is preached from the pulpits in this country week after week after week. So because of that we have a loving, self-loving, materialistic, dead religion that calls itself Christian. The Bible said if judgment begin first at the church of God, what shall be of them that obey not the truth? We're speaking this morning to you. Here you sit in the congregation. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. If we don't have any light in here, if we don't have any discernment in here, there is none. For they sure don't. And so when we come together as God's people, we should come together in prayer and say, Lord, show me thy way. Teach me thy way. It has done nothing. This so-called materialistic dead religion has done nothing about letting 60 million babies offered on the altar to Molech. It's done nothing about letting sodomite drag queens come into the schools to recruit our children. And now these television, one television network has dragtistic, I think it is, a play on the word of fantastic. They're going to have drag queens week after week strutting their stuff before people. Are, are you watching that garbage? Are you that sick? There's something needs to go on in your soul if you're not upset by that. The Bible says of, 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 uh, in the Old Testament book of, of uh, Genesis, in Genesis chapter number 19, what Lot was in Sodom, Peter said his conscience was vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. You're living in Sodom, folks. You're living in the midst of Sodom. You say, what's that got to do with us? It's got everything to do with us. As a result of this, the church has become blind. When you close your eyes to spiritual truth, when you begin to accept what the world accepts, you no longer can see the way you should be able to see. Blindness comes upon you. So what happens when the blindness comes upon us? Well, then if blindness is upon us, then my dear friend, we are in a bad condition for this country because they sure don't know what the truth is. They're having orgies in Chicago. 
They just recently broke up a bunch in a house. Over a thousand people, I think it was. They were just packed in there with each other. I'm talking about days ago. You're sitting in here this morning with masks on. And you're separated. And that's the way they say. Six foot distance. Social distancing, they call it. But here you've got a thousand people crammed into this building. And every kind of an ungodly, filthy, sexual perversion in the world was going on. That's America. Psychics are doing a booming business now because they want some answers. They're calling these psychics. They're advertising on television all the time. Uh, we'll talk to you for a dollar a minute, then two dollars a minute, then whatever. Make no mistake about it, they want their money. Like they know what they're talking about. And people are losing confidence in the system. The Lord Jesus said, you judge a tree by the fruit it bears. You're going to hear all kinds of babble. You're going to hear babble. And it reminds me of Nimrod in Babylon. The Babel, the, Bible, the Babel means that when they were building the Tower of Babel, God changed the languages and they couldn't communicate with each other. I don't know how many languages came out of it, but, but these people could not communicate. That's what's happening now. Because there's all kinds of confusion coming out. Everybody's got a take on this coronavirus. Where did it come from? What's it about? They're questioning... Was it a Chinese wet market? Was it bushmeat? They just recently removed a six foot worm from the brain of a Chinese woman that had been eating bushmeat. And the worm was wriggling when they got it out. Wiggling. In other words, it was alive and they took that six, six inch long, six inch, would I say foot? Six inch long. <laughs> Lord help us. Six, six inch long worm. They took out of her brain and they put it in a dish and it was wiggling. Can you imagine having that in your brain? You know where she get it? She got it from bush meat. Bush meat. You know what bush meat is? Bush meat is sold in these wet markets. China has a wet market that sells bush meat. The Ebola, Ebola virus that came out of Africa. Do you know where it came from? It came from bush meat. The reason I mentioned that is because that is one of the scenarios of where this stuff came from. So it either came from a wet market from bushmeat or a Chinese laboratory. The Wuhan Institute of Virology, Chinese Academy of Sciences, is a research institute on virology administered by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, located in a district of Wuhan, Hubei. It opened mainland China's first biosafety level 4 lab in 2015. It is very close, very close to the wet market where they're eating bush meat. The wet market has live animals. They sell live animals. They kill them right there. That's what's going on with these people. 3,400 years ago, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel what they could eat. Long before anybody knew anything about a virus or a bacteria. And you know what? Because Israel stuck to that cleanliness and to that diet when the Black Plague moved through Europe and it killed millions of people. The Jews were not dying like the rest of the people were. And this is where blood libel comes in. They blame the Jews for the plague that moved through Europe. The bubonic plague. They blamed the Jews for it because the Jews weren't dying. And the reason the Jews weren't dying, they were eating according to what Moses told them to eat. 1400 B.C. And they lived. Your diet is very important. What you eat. Washing your hands is important. Taking a bath is important. Human hygiene is important. Why do we have these masks on today? Because we don't want to breathe on somebody. We want them breathing on us. Because this thing can be transmitted, they say, now through your breath. When they started talking about this weeks ago, they came out and they said, no, 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 no. It's only in the droplets. Then the Germans. Watch the Germans. Watch the Germans. Listen to the Germans. Weeks ago, the Germans said, no, 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 no. It's in your breath. It's in the air. And now do you know what they're telling people? It's in your breath. It's in the air. And you can contract it from that. Now in Germany, the cases are falling. 
The cases are falling. The Germans are getting a handle on it. They're finding out what they can do to, to, to battle this virus. Live Science contacted several experts. And the reality, they said, is that we may never know where this deadly coronavirus originated. That ought to make cold chills run up and down your spine. It ought to make you do some thinking. Among the theories circulating that the SARS-CoV-2 arose naturally after passing from bats to a secondary animal and then to humans, or that it was deliberately engineered and then accidentally released by humans, or that researchers were studying a naturally occurring virus that subsequently escaped from a high security bio lab. The Wuhan Institute of Virology in China, the head of the lab at the, chi at the Institute, for her part, has emphatically denied any link to the Institute. Sure, they deny it, but in January, before anybody knew anything about a virus, the Chinese were already buying up all of the medical supplies they could get and were already covering up what was happening in China. It didn't come into China, it left from China. So what does this mean? Either way, it's terrifying. Either way, either way. Could it happen again and be even worse? Yes. Is China preparing a doomsday virus? We don't know. I'm not going to accuse China of anything. I don't know. But boy, I'll tell you right now. Has it gotten the attention of the world? Has something that you can't see with your eyes brought the entire world to its knees? Yes. Is it bankrupting people? Yes. Is it closing businesses that will never open again? Yes. Is this nation going into debt by trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to try to bail people out? Yes. Is it changing the political scene? Yes. We've got the globalists out there that were moving pell-mell and they, had, they were open borders and the globalists, this globalist, that. But now it's changing, changing, changing. So what's going to come out of it? Watch it. You judge a tree by the fruit it bears. You judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Are we headed for World War III? Yes. Yes. Because the Antichrist will rise bringing peace. 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 This is what Daniel said. By peace. By peace. He shall deceive many. The Antichrist is about peace. When we get into the tribulation that's soon coming, we've got four distinct groups of people in this tribulation. If we get this first part, first part, it'll help us understand a lot about the tribulation. Who are they, preacher? They're Gentiles. There's Jews. There's believing Gentiles and believing Jews. That's the four groups. The church of the living God, that's who we are, is not in that tribulation. We're not in there. But Gentiles will be. Listen to what he says in chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and know a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne of their face, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving sounds like David doesn't it bless God bless his name bless his righteous holy name did you know what folks when you get right with the Lord there'll be a song in your heart <laughs> have you lost your song don't you do you ever sing alone sometimes I can sing it away with it when people hear me sing they start running it works with this virus deal I hadn't thought about that I need to go around and start singing people get away from me I have to worry about them Sing, sing a new song that Bible talks about. Praise unto God. Lift up his holy name. The Lord's good, David said. He forgave me, cleansed me. Hallelujah to God. I'm not what I used to be and I'm not, folks. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I got a long line of bones behind me. But praise God, I've got nothing but light before me. Amen, amen, amen. But he says this. One of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence did they come? And I said, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. 
and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the only thing that will make your robes white. And that's the only thing that will wash your sins away. Is the precious blood of Christ. This is this revival they're talking about. Where thousands, yea, millions are saved. Where is that preacher? In the tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble. A lot of things happening. A lot of things that don't make sense right now. And let me tell you why. I want you to listen to what Peter said. This is important in understanding the Bible. Listen carefully now. If you don't hear anything else I've said this morning, remember this. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. All right, that's the two distinct comings of Christ. But look at the next verse. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, the ones doing the prophesying, not unto them, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now here's what the Lord says in Matthew 11. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. So what's all that mean, preacher? It means this. It means that I firmly believe that there are sections of this Bible that can only be understood and made sense of at the time. At the time. At the time. Imagine if you're here, tribulation saint. Imagine you've, you know, you're here and you know the church is gone. What are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to Revelation. That's where you're going to turn. The book of Revelation. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, Preacher, can you take the mark of the beast and not know it? So, I mean, what if I get an injection? Or what if I, what if I go to the hospital and they do surgery and they implant some kind of a electric, electronic device in my body? All kinds of different scenarios. I say, Preacher, she said to me, she said, this is the woman that took my blood, too. The one, my, my, uh, uh, I have to go once a month for my, my blood. I take blood thinner. She said, she said, would I be condemned? Would I be damned? I said, let me tell you something. When you take the mark of the beast, you'll take the mark of the beast. You will consciously know what you're doing because that will seal your doom forever. God's not playing tricks on you. He's not playing games with your soul. You will choose to take that mark. Say, so what is it, preacher? That's for the tribulation people. This is what this is about. It's for those people alive at the time of Jacob's trouble. It's for them. They'll know what the mark is. They'll know without a shadow of a doubt what the mark is. And they'll have a choice. Accept it or reject it. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. It will help you understand so much about the Bible because there are some things that just aren't that clear. Listen carefully. On the day of Pentecost when Peter got up to preach, he quoted Joel and he said, He shall pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Who's he talking to? He wasn't talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Israel. Pouring his spirit out on Israel. The Holy Ghost is going to come and be poured out on the Jews, folks. In the last days, that's taking place, it's going to take place in the tribulation period. Say, so why do you say that? Because if they had accepted him, that second opportunity they had in the book of Acts, then the millennium would have started and the Gentiles would have been saved through the hands of the Jews in the millennium, but it didn't happen. So he's going to pour out his spirit. Moses and Elijah are going to show up. They're going to come. They're going to come to the Jews. They're going to come to Jerusalem. They're going to preach to the Jews. The Jews are going to have Moses and Elijah preaching to them. You say, preacher, what's the tribulation about? It's about Israel. That's what it's about. It's about Israel. Now I've got something I need to tell you this morning. That's precious to my heart and to my soul. Say, so what is that? I'm looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. I am looking for His appearing. 
Because I'm going to tell you something. I don't think it's going to get better. No. I think this is a wake-up call. I think God is a gracious God and I think He's giving people an opportunity. You remember what He said in in the book of Revelation? He said, I gave her space to repent and she didn't repent. This is a wake-up call. God is speaking to people. Will you listen? Father, in Jesus' name, I bless your holy name. I thank you for your word. I thank you for another opportunity to stand up and proclaim it. Bless these folk and bless bless the folk that are watching on the internet and the folks that will watch this later on DVDs and whatever. I pray you bless your word now and anoint it as it goes forth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't want to scare you, but I want you to be alarmed. I have never in 73 years in this world seen anything that comes anywhere near what we're going through right now. God's got to be in this. He's got to be in it. I'm not exactly sure what he plans to bring out of it, but I believe he's in it. You say, do you think he brought it? No, I'm not necessarily saying he brought it, but nothing can happen without the permissive will of God. Nothing. Can't do it. Can't happen. Can't happen. And so, if you're not right with him this morning, why don't you do that? Now, I can't come down there. I don't have a mask on and I don't want to, you know, I don't do that. I can't do that. I couldn't preach with a mask on. No, I'd suffocate. But if you want to pray, you can come down and gather in places by yourself, you know, unless it's a family. If you're a family, then families can stay together because you're together anyway. But, uh, but if you're here by yourself, you can find a place down here.